This program is made possible through generous donations from viewers like you. To pledge your support, please visit arootawakening.tv slash give. Thank you. Two days ago, I just got off the plane from Israel back to the United States because I wanted to be here for the opening of the Care Right Files. It was in the spring of this year that I got together with Nehemi Gordon at our favorite coffee shop in Ebnik Refaim, and uh, as our usual coffee lasted about five hours that day, and Nehemi started out that he wanted to tell me about the road to Emmaus and his experience concerning the road to Emmaus. What developed from that is I said, Nehemia, I need you to come to America. I want you to stay at my place. Let's get together and we need to put some things down uh, for the entire world to be able to, to hear your background, your experience, because uh, ladies and gentlemen, I consider Nehemi Gordon to be the foremost, the, first of all, the most honest scholar that I've met in my life. I believe that he is the most intelligent uh, uh, biblical scholar that I've met uh, in more than 50 years. And he's a person that I can spend five hours with and it is nonstop. And so he came to uh, the United States, uh, stayed with me, and during that time, we did eight individual sessions, which we are calling the Kerite Files, in which Nehemi and I will be together here at the Aviv Moon Studios and laying out things from the scripture that I believe people have been waiting to hear for many, many years. Now, I just got back, uh, Nehemi and I got together for uh, for, for coffee again, and another four and a half, five hours later, um, I, I wanna say that I really appreciate Nehemiah's life, his scholarship, his honesty, his integrity. Uh, through the years, I've heard uh, people say, well, I heard that Nehemiah is turning people against Yeshua and all, and every time I would go to Nehemiah, ask if this is true, and I found out hit to him to be lied about, to be set up, and unfortunately, it's by Messianic and by Christian believers who have been the worst examples in the world, and if uh, left to them, they would never produce uh, or provoke one Jew to jealousy on the planet. But I will say that I consider Nehemiah Gordon to be a friend, and when Nehemiah Gordon tells me something, I know that I can trust his words, I can believe what he says, and he is uh, the only person on the planet that I can actually sit down with and have a biblically literate conversation with over a period of time discussing a number of subjects and you are going to be in on this. I wish that you could have been with us every night after we finished our sessions and as we get together in the home and, and uh, to, to relax together as we spent the, every night, day after day together for an entire week. Uh, I told Nehemiah that I think it has been one of the most enjoyable one week periods in my entire life uh, to be able to spend with him. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you get to enjoy this. Over the next eight weeks, I'm going to have Scott and Annie uh, lead you into this. Uh, there are so many irons in the fire. We are getting ready for Yom Trua. We're getting ready to do the convention for the Chinese. Uh, the chronological gospels are now in Mandarin, and I will be with you for that uh, live event for uh, Yom Trua, for that event, so you need to sign up for it. You, you cannot get in the studio. We are jam-packed. We were sold out in 48 hours, uh, uh, and so there's no way to get in, but you can watch online. You need to be here for that because, ladies and gentlemen, the prophets speak of what is going to transpire with China in the last days as well. You need to be aware of it. Of course, it doesn't translate it in English as China, but as Nehemiah spent over a year there, and as we have been led into it, we are seeing the Almighty open the doors for the Chinese people. We believe that we have entered into this last phase, and so you need to be here by way of the internet for this event, and I will see uh, some of you out on the West Coast. If you speak Chinese, you'll be there for our event out there at the very beginning of October, and so it's good to be back home with you. It's good to be back here at A Root Awakening. Uh, our, our staff is so blessed and excited to be able to serve you and to minister to you around the world, and now, Scott and Annie with Shabbat Night Live. Michael, it's going to be a great show tonight. 
Bobby. Stand by, studio. 30 seconds. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live. Michael Rood is hard at work creating more episodes for his most eagerly anticipated show ever, The Chronological Gospels. Yes, indeed, The Chronological Gospels TV show is set to premiere on Saturday, October 1st. Mark your calendar. It's going to be on the Dish Network, channel 262. The first show will be uh, Saturday, of course, uh, at 7 p.m. You can also watch it on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, so be watching for that. You can also watch uh, uh, Shabbat Night Live on Dish Channel 262 starting in October, and that will air at 6 p.m. every Friday night if you would like to get your Shabbat started a little early. As for Shabbat Night Live tonight, uh, please welcome my co-host. You know her as the Director of Ministry Development for Rude Awakening International, Annie Reid. Welcome, Annie. Shabbat Thank shalom. Thank you. It's good to be here. Good to have you with us. So <laughs> we, ha we have a lot of exciting things. Oh, happening. my gosh. We have so much sitting on the table here. I don't know if you, you can't see it quite yet, but we are going to get into all kinds of crazy stuff today. There's mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of things going on. Uh, the first of which being uh, you are going to be on a new show uh, yes. on the Aviv TV network. Tell us a little bit about what's going on there with you. Well, let's tell them about what's Aviv, uh, Aviv TV in general. Um, yeah. And for those that don't know or are unfamiliar with our email blast and all of the new things that are happening on our website, we have a new network starting on Fridays mm -hmm. till Sundays for Shabbat. Yes, and that just started last weekend, uh, September 2nd. Mm -hmm. It is now underway, so uh, check it out. It's avivtv.com. And uh, you have a show called, uh, along with several others on the show, The Rude Report. Absolutely. It will be a uh, live newsletter, so to speak. Oh, okay. So it'll be exciting. We're going to share not what's only in the newsletter, but we're mm -hmm. going to talk about relevant topics and news that is currently happening. So our first episode, we're going to talk about uh, Shabbat, uh, I'm sorry, September 11th. Okay. Oh, very relevant. Yes. Uh, we uh, There's another show we have on there, uh, a health show mm -hmm. called The Health Awakening, and uh, I'm doing The Health Awakening show. And uh, that is, uh, we're going to bring on guests and talk about things that are not normally talked about on shows that you would normally see on network TV. These are sort of the underground things that you hear on websites that keep getting shut down because <laughs> they're telling the truth. And uh, so that we have our first guest. His name is Dr. David Brown. Steen, and he is an expert on thyroid and salt, which a lot of women are concerned about these days. We're going to find out why. Well, I'm excited about AvivTV.com. Please visit us. It's actually airing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully we get to see you there every single Shabbat. Right. And it's, it's speaking of Shabbat, it's every weekend, Friday, Shabbat, mm -hmm. and Sunday. And that's the only time it's going to be broadcast. So if you want to see things uh, during the week sometime, uh, you'll be seeing, you know, last month's episode. What we're doing is basically updating it every month. So if you missed one week, you can watch it the next couple of weekends uh, within the same month and still see it. Uh, but that's how that show is going to go. Uh, now, speaking of this month, our love gift. This I'm is excited. a special love gift. <laughs> go ahead, go read what you say about it. Well, it's fall feast time and everybody knows it's my favorite time of year. Mm. Um, you know, everybody prepares a little bit differently for the fall feast and um, my husband and I were actually doing a cleanse mm -hmm. just to kind of get our minds ready and our bodies ready for Yom Kippur, you know, Yom Trua and Sukkot as well. So. Yeah, we're preparing our hearts as well. We we use it as a time with our with our family. We sort of sit back and go, okay, is there someone we've wronged? Is there, uh, you know, are we holding a grudge? Is there a situation that's not made right? And we specifically use that time to say, okay, well, let's just bite the bullet, make it right, and you feel so much better after that. You know what I mean? I agree. And then you can go into the fall feast with a clean heart and just celebrate what we know is coming with Yeshua's return and all the rest. Now, speaking of Yeshua's return, that is the title not Yeshua's return specifically, but the Day of Trumpets, right here. This is the uh, ninth episode in Michael's uh, The Ministry of the Messiah series. And uh, it is uh, September's love gift uh, for a donation of $50 or more. You can get this right here. 
and it's uh, it's all about the Day of Trumpets. And uh, I'm not going to give it all away. You got to get the the. Uh, <laughs> the uh, episode. I was going to say the lesson. It is a lesson, but it's an episode. And if you give $100 or more, you get, oh yes, they mustn't, much anticipated, Ram's Horn Shofar. These are beautiful shofars. This is one we just picked out of the box. They're all this nice. I don't know if you can see that. That's beautiful. And uh, everybody loves to have a shofar for the mm -hmm. fall feast. If you don't have one yet, this is a great opportunity to get one because if you just give to the ministry, you'll get a shofar. Now make sure you go to the love gift page on our, our store. That's where the love gifts live. And uh, you can uh, go there anytime and donate and uh, have yourself a shofar. And Michael's latest teaching, wonderful stuff. Now, I, I don't want to go too far into this program without mentioning the uh, special that we have right now for the Israel tour. Right, yes. Yes, uh, the Israel tour is coming up. I mean, you may not be thinking about it right now because it's coming up in March, mm -hmm. March 19th to 30th. Uh, 2017 to be exact. I think I have those dates right. Uh, if not, it's very close to that. And, uh, you know, in March, you're not thinking about, you know, registering just yet. You're talk, still talking to family, so you still, if you want to do it. But uh, now is the time to act because if you register before uh, September 30, you can save $200 off the price of the tour. And that is not insignificant. So if you want to go on the tour, I encourage you to go to rudetour.com. Take a look around, uh, pray about it, talk to family about it, see what you want to do because September 30th, that deal is going away. So if you want to save some money and go to Israel with Michael Rude, which by the way is a tour like none other. I agree. You know, when people often ask us, well, you know, can we get a video of the tour? Well, no, it's so special. We're not going to videotape it. No. There, you just can't capture this on video. So. We want you to be there uh, for the tour. That's why we've never, never taped it. You, you just got to see it. Got to see it to believe it. It's one of those intimate moments that you have to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to really capture the culture and the, to the sites yourselves. Um, right. So I'm excited about the Israel tour. I'm excited about the Israel tour contest mm -hmm. that is oh, happening. Oh, that's right. Yes, that too. Uh, if you'd like to win your way to Israel, you can do that too. Uh, just go to uh, arudeawakening.tv slash story. Now, why the word story? Because we want you to tell your story. Uh, you've heard on Shabbat Night Live here where, where Michael has said he wants you to tell your story. Uh, tell your story and uh, basically um, the story that, that resonates most with, with our, our Shabbat Night Live watchers and everybody just is, wow, that's the story of a lifetime. That person will be going to Israel for free, no matter where you live in the world. Michael has said he will fly you to Israel no matter where you live. It doesn't have to be from the States. You don't have to fly out of JFK. Uh, and you'll be going to Israel free. So check that out at rudeawakening.tv slash story. Let's not forget that we have Yom Trua right around the corner. Oh yes, gosh, let's not forget about that. <laughs> it's going to be an exciting event for those that are here. And uh, we're going to uh, have a couple of guests, mm -hmm. um, one we cannot name for right. safety reasons for that individual. Um, but the second individual that's going to be here is Bill Cloud. So we're excited that Bill's going to be here. He's going to speak on the spir spiritual wilderness wow. that we encounter not only at the end times, but currently right now in our lives. Mm. You know, for many of us, we're persecuted in our own little way. And uh, so that should be an encouraging chat. Yes, in indeed. And Michael, uh, you remember a while ago, uh, for the very reason that he decided not to do any more episodes right now of the Wednesday Night Bible Studies, because he was, re he was really heavy on his heart. Yehovah just downloaded this... Um, revelation to him. And it, it impacted him so much that he actually left the country for a couple of days and just to get alone and think about this and pray about this. And what does this mean for the ministry? Mm -hmm. He's going to reveal that on Yom Teruah. And uh, it's a very, uh, he's hinted to us what it is. I'm not going to uh, tell you anything about it, but it's very, very uh, shocking. Uh, it, it'll, it'll rock your world, but in a, in a good way. So you really want to tune in and, and see that. And the way you can do that, uh, there are no more seats available in our studio audience to be at Yom Teruah. But we're offering it online. You can watch at uh, yomteruahcharlotte.com. Just go there. You can get all the details. And uh, that is coming up soon. So you want to sign up for that uh, right away. Now, let's get into the calendar. Before we've talked all the, <laughs> about all these things on the calendar. And uh, well, like I said, it's an exciting month it's a, an, or it a fun season. It is. It is a fun season. There's so much going on. You, you think Passover is busy. You know, you've got Yom Teruah and 
Day of Trumpets and, and you know, Sukkot, it's all, you know, comes one after the other. We've got a little bit of time to plan yet, so let's go to your calendar. Here we are, we are uh, on the September 9th into September 10th. Uh, we're right starting uh, the biblical month of Elul, as we alluded to, El alluded to, no pun intended, <laughs> <laughs> the beginning of the, of the program. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is an exciting time. This is the day, uh, the time in history uh, when Yeshua sent out the, the 12 pairs in search of the lost sheep of Israel. You can see how Yeshua sets this up at this time of year. You how know? appropriate. Yeah, for the, you know, for the, the end gathering and, and the end times and all that kind of thing. So he was very much in tune with, um, with what he wanted to say and when he said it so that people would understand what he said. Uh, that's just the way Yeshua did things, you know, and uh, and so when he, he he sent them out to search out the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now this is event number ninety-eight in the chronological gospels. Now if you have it, it's on page uh, one thirty. That's where it is on page one one thirty in the chronological gospels. Uh, it was all about trust, as we were talking about. What you know? Do you trust Yehovah or do you, are you trusting in yourself? Um, you know, how do you live your life? And I've learned a lot about that in the last few years. Uh, you and I are both from different countries. Yes, we are. You're from Mexico. I'm from Canada. We have both had to trust Yehovah to be in this country and have him establish permanence here for us. And, you know, we have to be so careful with our words, too. Uh, now, tonight, Michael has had so much fun with Nehemiah Gordon in the last few weeks during Shabbat Night Live's Q&A sessions that he's invited Nehemiah to come back for some more in-depth teachings on Shabbat Night Live. They're going to take the whole time. Uh, specifically, uh, the whole teaching session, that we're going to be calling these the Karaite Files. Why? Because... Well, Nehemiah is a Karaite, so <laughs> I decided to give a little bit of an X-Files uh, uh, feel to it. And you can get it all on DVD. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, as you may know, Nehemiah is a Karaite Jew, and he uh, and Michael get into some very interesting topics that uh, we thought would be great for Shabbat Night Live's teaching sessions. So uh, there will be eight of these Karaite file teaching sessions uh, in all, and you can see these uh, here on the program for the next several weeks. Of course, we're going to take time out for Yom Teruah on the 30th, but other than that, uh, we'll keep going after that. And if you like what you see, you can pre-order the whole set on DVD. Now, we don't have them on DVD yet. We're preparing for it. There's nothing in this case yet, but uh, we will be able to have these to you. In fact, Nehemia uh, is going to be... Uh, uh, with Michael, and we're going to be doing these all of these eight weeks. So you can start ordering it today. The Karai Files will be an eight-disc uh, set, and it will be available during the first part of November because that's when the shows are done. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, pre-order now, you can save 20% off the regular price. Uh, you'll end up paying uh, $43.95, a great deal. And uh, up next, it's Q&A with Michael and Nehemia Gordon, followed by the inaugur inaugural <laughs> first, let's say, episode of the Karai Files. Stay with us. How much does the understanding of the culture and times of the Bible matter to us today, or for our understanding of prophecy in the future? Learn how to properly interpret biblical culture and times, and get a glimpse into the prophetic fulfillment of the fall feasts in Michael Rood's new teaching, The Day of Trumpets. This is Yeshua's teaching in the Capernaum Synagogue, and it is on the last day and the resurrection. He will be the one that raises us. The Day of Trumpets is part of Michael Rood's 20 episode Love Gift Teaching Series. Own the Day of Trumpets today for a donation of $50 or more. Or donate $100 or more to get the Day of Trumpets plus a beautiful ram's horn shofar. Hurry, supplies are limited. Call now or visit us online to receive the Day of Trumpets, episode nine of Michael Rood's 20 episode Love Gift Teaching Series. a warm and endearing letter sent in. I gave you the chart at Passover that proved that Israel's enslaved in Egypt 400 years. Four days later, I sent the attached email to Nehemi Gordon. It has been my experience that even the Karaites refused to accept the whole truth of the Torah. I took exception to Michael's teaching and the seminar by Dr. Miles Jones that Israel is only enslaved 260 years, which is false doctrine. And of course, Dr. Miles Jones is the one who trains second graders to 
on televised debates a defeat Mensa Society geniuses with calculators on advanced mathematical calculations, but of course, Miles Jones can't, uh, can't, can't count or anything here. And then, any so-called scholar teaching otherwise is teaching falsely. Are you condoning that? Why have I not seen any effort to correct that which was erroneously taught? If a rude awakening can't be trusted to correct a discovered error, what other falsehoods might be this organization hiding from us, Torah fans? Tell the people the truth. What are you waiting for? Well, Nehemi, what are we waiting you for? You can't handle the truth. No, look, what's this guy's problem? I mean, really, so he has a disagreement on how you understand certain verses in the Torah, and therefore you're a false teacher, it's false doctrine, you're hiding from the people things. I mean, what are we talking about? Yeah, here? I, and I remember this 430. Is, this one I learned like in second grade so, in uh, uh, in Sunday school. So, this so, was our position back then. So look, here's what it, here's the different verses in Genesis 15:3. It talks about how God says to Moses, he or God says to Moses, he says to Avram, he says, <laughs> yeah, back in Genesis, <laughs> a little early there. He says your uh, your descendants will be uh, uh, sojourners and and slaves in. Um, in a land that's not theirs for 400 years. Okay, and there's two parts to that. There'll be sojourners and, um, and there'll be slaves. Let's, let's read it, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Let's I, read the verse. Let's make sure we're getting this all right so we don't have false doctrine. Like, like seriously, this, this is such a... Uh, okay, you so-called scholar, uh, let's open up the scriptures. So what are we talking about here? So let, let's say <laughs> and, we... And I, say, I have to say, see, when Nehemi is reading this stuff, he's not, this he's giving you the English. He's just really yeah. reading oh, the I, English, but he's reading I, the I, Hebrew. I can show it there, to there's you. No, there's no right English there on the Hebrew. page, people. Okay. It's the Hebrew. So okay. let's hear Genesis, what the so-called okay. Karai scholar has to say. Okay, so this is Genesis 15. What did I say? Verse 3, it's not verse It's verse uh, 13. 15, 13. 13. 13. And he said to Abraham, you shall uh, surely know that Ger, a stranger, a sojourner, um, shall be your seed in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them and they shall oppress them 400 years. So there's actually three things here. One is there'll be a sojourner land that's not theirs. Two, they will serve them, be slaves to them. And number three is they'll oppress them. Now. It, and that'll be for 400 years. Does 400, the 400 years cover the oppression, the oppression and the slavery, or the, the being the gear, the foreigner, the sojourner, the oppression? There's three different things. And it doesn't necessarily cover all four of them. The point of, is in verse 14. And also that nation um, that they shall serve, I shall judge, and afterwards they will go out with great property. So the, and then he goes on and he says in verse 16, I'll jump ahead, and the fourth generation shall return here for uh, the... Uh, iniquity of the Amorite will not be complete until here, until then. So the point is, look, they're gonna, you're not going to get this land that I promised you for another 400 years because I, I can't just wipe out the Amorites. They don't deserve it right now. They maybe mm -hmm. do, but I'm going to give them a chance. I'm going to give them 400 years of chances to repent. And mm -hmm. only at the end of that will you be allowed to get this land. And so. uh, we'll go into uh, slavery. We'll come out in the fourth generation. Fourth generation That's right. another part of the mathematical right. equation here. Well, and so if you only had this verse, and we know about the exodus from Egypt, we might think they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. That'd be a reasonable understanding. Uh, it might not be the only one, because you could say they were sojourners for 100 years and then 300 years slaves, or they were slave, you know, sojourners for 100 years, slaves for another 100 years, bringing us to 200 years, and only the, the real oppression, because that's a third thing, uh, affliction, came you know, later on in that process. I mean, those are all possibilities. Okay. I don't know why holding these possibilities would make you a false teacher. And having fa like, why is this such a, a critical issue that we're throwing out these terms? False teacher, false doctrine. Um, that's just so immature. I'm, I'm sorry, it really is. Like, like I, I don't understand it. Like, it, it, it'd be as if you were teaching that um, the true creator of the universe is Satan. Like, th that's what it makes it sound like you're teaching. Mm -hmm. Like, is yeah. that like what on earth are we talking about here? We're talking about how long were they slaves in Egypt? Um, Exodus 12, verse 41, says as follows. I'll read it in the Hebrew if you want. We, we're running out of time. I'll read yeah, it I'll read it in English. Go, go it ahead. came to pass at the end of 430 years. In that very day, all the hosts of Jehovah went out of Egypt. Okay, so if you only had Genesis 15, 13, 
you could say, look, we don't have to discuss this. It's just so clear. We know it's 400 years. But now we've got another verse that talks about 430 years. And what that tells us is we need to throw the simplistic readings out of the window because things are maybe more complicated than we thought. 400 mm -hmm. years there, 430 years. People have written in Jewish uh, Bible commentaries, have written uh, many, many, many pages on this topic. I once researched this in depth. And many people have written lots of different opinions on this. Um, and, there's, and there's all kinds of different solutions. One verse is 400 years, another says 430. So one solution is to say the 400 years begins with Isaac. The 430 years begins when God chose Abraham or Abraham chose God um, or Abram chose God. Um, and so that's the gap of th 30 years because in mm -hmm. Genesis he says your descendants. Well, Abraham's not included in his own descendants. He is, you know, the father of the descendants. Mm -hmm. um, right. Another possibility is to say, no, it really was 430 years. And when God said 400 years, he was rounding off. Another possibility is to say it was 400 years, but they sinned, so they got an extra 30 years of hard time tacked on. That's actually one of the uh, explanations in the rabbinical Bible commentators, which is entirely possible. These are all very reasonable explanations. No. Why do we need to be throwing out terms like false doctrine, false teacher, when there's a lot of, there's many different possibilities. Well, the Samaritans, they, they also have a, a, yeah, a so, tradition. So what they do is they add the words in verse 41, they say, they, it says in the land of Egypt, that 430 years, they say, add the words, and the land of Canaan. Now, the words they add are the way that all Jews read it. Pretty much all Jews agree that the 430 years doesn't only limit itself to the land of Egypt, but also Canaan. And by the way, uh, you have this great uh, video you, you sent me which is called the um, uh, Patterns of Evidence Patterns Exodus. Of evidence. Yeah, I've, I've and, and one of the things right that here. we know from archaeology is that the land of Canaan was actually under Egyptian rule during some of this period. Mm -hmm. That the Egyptians actually uh, treated the uh, Canaanite uh, city-states as vassals. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, um, so Abram being a sojourner and, and Isaac and Jacob in the land of Canaan, that was actually being, it's like being in Puerto Rico and saying, oh, but you're not in America. Well, I mean, it's under American rule. Anyway, so, um, so here you have the, this um, 430 years, 400 years. If you look at Exodus 6, and this is homework for people. I don't think we're going to have time to get to it. Read Exodus chapter 6, verses 16, 18, and 20, and you'll see that there's the first three generations who are Levi or Levi. Or That's right. You, or, and so he and was an adult when he came down there. He was an adult, and he lived to be 137 years. And then Kahat lived to be 133 years. Amram lived to be 137 years, same as his grandfather. Right. And Moses was 80 when they left Egypt. Add those all together, you get 487. However, Levi wasn't a baby when he came to Egypt. He was already an adult. And I mm -hmm. think it's safe to assume that Amram wasn't on his deathbed when he, uh, when he fathered Moses. And uh, his grandfather wasn't on his deathbed. Uh, Kahat wasn't on his deathbed when he grandfathered Amram. Mm -hmm. so, so to get 400 years in Egypt itself would really be a stretch. In other right. words, the, and it's the, just four generations. Four, Levi well, has a daughter, yeah. Yochebed, right. and she marries her nephew, mm -hmm. who is Amram. Right. They have Moses. Moses' children are adults by that time. Right. Well, we know and, Moses and they, is 80 when they leave Egypt. Yeah. So the point is that um, there's a, a bunch of very reasonable ways to read this. If you want to be hyper literal and say there were 430 years in Egypt, then you've got this, you know, 133-year-old Kahat who's, who's fathering a child. You know, it could be. It's possible. But if somebody doesn't agree with that, are we going to call them a false teacher and label this false doctrine and say you're hiding things? I mean, come on, guys. I'm not hiding anything. You've got homework. We've given you the verses. Go work it out for yourself in fear and trembling with prayer and study before the Lord. Can I get an amen, Michael? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll be back right after this word for our sponsors out there. Michael Rood's Message of Truth is broadcast all over the world, but none of it happens without the monthly financial support of our Ambassador Club members. And right now, membership has more benefits than ever. I'm giving into a ministry that is helping to feed other people that have the same hunger that I do. Join now, and Michael Rood will send you the Ambassador Club Welcome Kit, an exclusive messenger bag stocked with teaching DVDs, Red Sea Crossing cards, and more. You'll also receive ambassador-only bonus gifts whenever you make a separate donation to receive the monthly love gift. 
Best of all, you'll get ambassador-only sale prices in our online bookstore several times throughout the year. Plus, exclusive invitations to Ambassador Club functions at Arute Awakening events. All it takes is a modest commitment of $100 per month or an annual gift of $1,200. Call now or visit the Arute Awakening website to join the Ambassador Club. Your support of Arute Awakening International spreads the truth to others and inspires testimonies from all over the world. I started watching Michael Reed's videos on YouTube and I knew right then that I had finally found the truth I had been searching for. I am, at last, happy and alive. I still have a long way to go, but I know that I am finally on the right path. Call now or visit our website to support A Rude Awakening International. Thank you. The last night that Yeshua was with his disciples, the last supper before the Passover was sacrificed, he took bread and he took wine. He said before that Abraham saw his day and rejoiced, but what does that mean? He saw his day and rejoiced. Well, it was the Melech Zadik, the king of righteousness that brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. He blessed the Most High with the blessing that Abraham taught Yitzhak, Yitzhak taught Yaakov, and is still spoken today whenever bread and wine is served at a Jewish table, whenever it is Sabbath, especially around the world, the bread and the wine are brought forth with this blessing. Baruch Gata Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua then said, Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood that pays the sin penalty because of the broken covenant. As often as we do this, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. So break the bread. Share the wine, and we do this in remembrance of him until he comes. Thank you for watching our broadcast. If you are enjoying this, click the subscribe button below this video. By subscribing to our channel, you will receive immediate updates on new videos we post in the future. Now, back to the teaching. Have a blessed time. A number of years ago, I was attempting to find a statement that would articulate the mission of a rude awakening. And it was at that time that I really grieved over the usage of this, but I decided that this mission statement was going to be restoring the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. And I really fought for a long time about even using the word Christian because what faith we're talking about is, uh, as it says in Jude, that before the end of the first century, things had become so polluted that it's said to earnestly contend, fight for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And it was the Jewish followers of the Jewish Messiah that got the good news of the gospel of the kingdom out to the Gentiles. And once it got out there, things went pretty wild, pretty fast. And it was about 300 years later that the religion of Christianity, uh, basically invented by Constantine, came about. But before then, it was Jewish followers of the Jewish Messiah who lived a life in context with that which we were given from Mount Sinai, the commandments that we were told never to add to, never to subtract from. And it was Yeshua who came and put the plumb line down between the rules and regulations of man and the plain truth truth of obedience to the Torah, that no one is allowed to add, no one is allowed to subtract. He lived it, he showed us how to live it, and then he said, follow me, put your footprints in the place that I put my feet. 
And so I decided that I was going to, to use this terminology, restoring the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith, uh, to really go back past Constantine, back to the first century, and back to the book of Acts, really. Now, I made this journey myself. I was raised in the Baptist church. My father's side of the family, uh, Rude, my great-great-great-grandpappy was Anshul Rude, who started the first Ashkenazi synagogue in his home in Amsterdam. A few generations later, Isaac Michael Rude was the one that built all of the synagogues that are still standing in Amsterdam. But our family moved over to Michigan about an hour from Holland, Michigan. It seems like uh, we came from the place that was the, the wettest place we could find over in Europe below sea level, and we came over and found ourselves surrounded by the Great Lakes, and that is where Holland, Michigan, Zeeland, Michigan, and uh, in the area that I grew up uh, full of the, uh, of the Dutch and Dutch Jews there, but I grew up in a Baptist world, in a Baptist church, and as I uh, would often uh, joke, uh, there were no Baptist Jews back in the first century. Well. I was raised in this kind of world, completely separated from the commonwealth of Israel, knowing nothing of the commandments, and it wasn't, uh, uh, my father didn't darken the doorstep of a church for the longest period of time, and then uh, he ended up, well, when I was uh, in sixth grade, going uh, to Grand Rapids Baptist Bible College and learning Hebrew, and that's when he started to, to go back and, and touching into the Hebrew. But what happened when I was 17 years of age is that is when I really started to become connected back with the Hebrew roots, back with my ancestry, and that's when I began to get a cold drink of water and an understanding, and finally, the Gospels were making sense to me. That's when they started to make sense to me, and I, I began that journey. But that journey was, was then shortcut uh, after I moved to Israel, and it was there that I met a man who has had one of the, the biggest, the greatest impacts on the Hebrew roots movement, so to speak, in helping uh, believers to get back to the Hebrew roots of the faith, and he was one that came from a completely different background. Uh, he was raised uh, as the son of a rabbi, generations of rabbis, and it was because of his background and the stand that he took and understanding the scriptures, being fluent in Hebrew, and uh, became a, a scholar with Hebrew University, translated the on the Dead Sea Scrolls, the official publication project, uh, an editor on the scientific version of the Aleppo Codex, and he has had a, a great impact on my life, and it was my opportunity uh, to, to introduce him uh, basically to the world through my, my video on the great secret of Solomon's Temple uh, that I was able to, to get his name out before some of the believers in America, uh, but he has continued on a path that has truly been inspiring and has come up with some of the greatest research that has had an impact on my life. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to welcome to the program Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah, great to have you here. Hello, Michael. It's really great to be here. Well, Nehemiah, tell us, uh, you are, you're, you're the son of a rabbi mm -hmm. that uh, you know, passed away recently, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but uh, uh, your, your background was mm -hmm. uh, uh, orthodox, you grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, what happened, because yeah. your life started to change from that orthodox upbringing mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, and uh, to yes. bring you where you are today. So, I, you know, I, I was... Um I was, you know, and you mentioned that you were, you know, of Jewish ancestry, but raised Baptist. I, I was raised as an Orthodox Jew. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Messianic. I tell people that up front. Being raised as an Orthodox Jew, I was taught literally sitting on my father's knee when I was three years old. He told me that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, he received two distinct revelations. And this is actually the core doctrine, both of modern Orthodox Judaism and the ancient Pharisees, who were their forebears, and my forebears, really. And I was taught that Moses received this second revelation called the Oral Torah. And you can't understand a single word of that written Torah, the five books of Moses, without first reading and hearing what it has to say in the Oral Torah, the Oral Law. I started studying the written Torah in second grade. Actually, the summer before second grade, I had a rabbi who sat with me in the park. And we went through the book of Genesis, and he would read a verse, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim et ha I would repeat after him, and then the English translation, we went verse by verse. That was even before second grade with a private tutor, and then we went through the Torah in first grade, 
Then uh, sec third grade, going to a Jewish school, I started to study the Mishnah, which is the core part of the oral law. And then in fourth grade, the Talmud. And at this very young age, in third grade and fourth grade, I said, wait a minute, what we learned last year in the Torah, that's, that's different. In the Torah, it's in the Lord spoken to Moses saying, and now we're reading completely different sorts of things. We're reading Rabbi Meir says one thing, Rabbi Akiva disagrees and says the opposite. And, the, and both of these are the words of the living God. That's what I was being taught. And I, I heard this and I said, this doesn't make any sense to me. And I went to my rabbis, to my teachers at my school, and I said, surely we should embrace the word of God in the written Torah. And when this oral Torah disagrees, this Talmud, this Mishnah, we should reject it because it's just the words of men. And to me, this was just, I was stating the obvious. Um, and quite frankly, I, I think other people saw this too, but they knew to keep their mouth shut. I didn't know. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> told me. There was this kind of inside, um, you know, implicit um, look. And I actually was told at some points, if you don't believe it, just fake it. But I didn't know how to fake it. So I said, we got to just reject this. It's false, this, this oral Torah. And I was told, you mustn't say that. That's what those heretics, the Karaites, say. And I found out throughout Jewish history, there had always been Jews who only believed in the written scripture called Karaites, from the ancient Hebrew word kara. Kara is the word that is the ancient word for, for the Old Testament. You know, today Jews use the word Tanakh, which is an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im Ketuvim, the law, the prophets, and the writings, Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Mm -hmm. In ancient times, they said Kara, and we still use that in modern Hebrew as Mikra. Um, so Karaites were scripturalist Jews, and I realized I was a scripturalist. I didn't even know that such a thing existed, but it was immediately obvious to me that this is what I was. And early on, and I'm talking about like I'm in fourth grade, and the rabbis are telling me, well, but you can't be a Karaite. They, they don't exist anymore. And if you follow in this path, you will cease to exist. And that's a scary thing to wow. tell a fourth grader. Right, You're going right. to die and, and uh, you know, end up in oblivion if you just follow the Bible. And I said, I don't care. I have to follow it. I, I have no choice. It's the truth. I, I, I you know, felt compelled to do it. And, and, I, you know, and, and one of the things they told me early on is, well, you don't know enough. I mean, I don't know if the, the audience, can the audience see here the Talmud? You have a full set of the Babylonian yeah, Talmud. Right, right here, yeah, the Babylonian Talmud right right here in front of us. So the so there's two Talmuds. And, and this is the, this yeah. is what you were studying oh, in the fourth grade. This is what I was studying in fourth grade. This, mm -hmm. is, this is the main, uh, you know, we call it the oral law, the oral Torah, but it was actually written down between the year 200 and 500 AD after the temple was destroyed. In the time of Yeshua, it was still oral. Um, by my time, it was all written down. And I'm being told, look, this is a lot of books. You don't know enough to be able to read the Bible by yourself. When you've read all of this and you're master the Hebrew language, then you can have the authority to interpret scripture by yourself. And, the, and what they would say to me is they said, you know, who are you to interpret the Bible for yourself? Thousands of years of, of rabbis, your father, your great grandfather, your other ancestors who were rabbis. How dare you go up against them and try to read the Bible for yourself? And my answer was, I'm the one who will stand before God on the day of judgment and be able to answer for my actions. And I won't tell him, well, the rabbi told me to do it. Do it. That's why uh -huh, I did it, uh -huh. which is what they told me. They said, well, it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Just tell God on the day of judgment. They actually said this to me. I was obeying the rabbi, and then you've got nothing to worry about in the world because God will, will accept your actions if you were obeying the rabbi. And I said, no way. I'm responsible for my own actions. You know, the, the snake told me to eat the, the fruit. We, we heard that story before. Somebody else told me to do it. <laughs> I, I mean, I was just stating what was to me obvious. And, and, um, and what I actually decided to do is I said, I need to know ancient Jewish literature better than any rabbi because, you know, they've got a point. Who am I? Okay, I'm... I, I'm standing before God and I'm responsible for my actions. That's actually kind of important. But I do want to make sure I'm getting it right. So I ended mm -hmm. up moving to Israel, studying at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, working on ancient Hebrew manuscripts, eventually getting a master's degree in biblical studies. And really all of this was in response to my rabbi in fourth grade saying to me, uh, you don't know enough to interpret, to even read the Bible for yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I needed to know more than he did. I well, I, I have to say something <laughs> here and uh, say something to our viewers out there that uh, uh, th this is really a great insight, going all the way back to fourth grade to see this stand because uh, Nehemiah is, uh, if not the most honest, one of the most honest people I have ever known in my life because it doesn't matter what he thinks, where, he, where it came from, uh, he's searching for the truth and looking for the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when it's uh, to his, the detriment of, uh, of his uh, particular 
world, he will still bring forth uh, evidence that he finds in antiquity and has been a great resource. As a matter of fact, I say without Nehemiah's work, the chronological gospels, uh, there would be so many uh, very important things that I would not have been able to articulate without his background on it because very honestly, uh, telling it the way it is and giving us the historical documentation uh, because it's basically been covered up by these stories that you say, the, the literature, and, mm -hmm. and you have searched this literature, yeah. you've searched the reality of these things. I mean, the, so. the way I, I, I've come to look at it is, you know, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Karah, the Old Testament is, is this word, perfect word of God, this truth, and it's been covered by layers and layers and layers of tradition. Now, when I did my bachelor's degree at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, I, I, I worked as an archaeologist over one summer, excavating an ancient site, and I literally spent an entire summer removing dirt from a dirt floor. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and it it sounds ridiculous, but, and at times I was working with a toothbrush because the dirt floor was a certain consistency and color and I had to remove the dirt from it. And what I've realized is that's kind of what, what we all need to do when we're trying to get to scripture and cut through the tradition. And especially from my upbringing in Judaism, we would say, oh, that's in the Bible. I mean, even they joke about it in The Fiddler on the Roof. Tevye says, the, uh, he says, oh, that's in the good book. But that's authentic. I, I meet people all the time who say, well, that's in the Bible. Really, where is it? Well, I know it's in the Bible. And they read the whole Bible and I'm like, huh, how is it not in there? You think it's in there because your rabbis told you mm -hmm. it was in there. And so or we saw a movie. We saw, we the, saw the movie, movie play. Right. Um, right. You know? So what, what we need to do is remove the dirt from the dirt floor, which takes it it's, can be challenging at times because the dirt looks just like the dirt floor unless you know to, to discern the two. And that's really what, 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 I've, what I've realized I, I think we all need to do is there's these layers and layers of tradition that are covering this beautiful floor of the scripture and we've got to remove them and get to the original thing. And that can be challenging at times, um, but it's so worthwhile. You know, you mentioned about truth and, and I found out something about myself about four years ago Michael that you probably don't know um, I don't know if I've shared this with you I've shared it with a few people so I found well, out I think uh, here it share, is. share it with the world now so I found out that I have a, a, a form of autism called Asperger's and one of the characteristics of this autism is an obsession with truth and and I'm talking about like a woman says do I look good in this dress and I tell her <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, don't ask me a question you don't want to answer. And, and it really is an obsession of, with truth, even to the point where maybe it offends people. But, and other people may get to that truth as well, but they have this filter in their head that says, oh, I know I shouldn't say that. That will upset everybody. And somebody with, like me with autism just says what's on their mind. And, and and focuses and follows that truth to a well, that, that really explains a lot. It explains everything, doesn't it? It explains a I'm lot. I'm telling you. You know, and, and this is something that, that Shaul says in his yeah. uh, letter to the believers in Thessalonica. Yeah. Because they receive not the love of the truth, God yeah. will send them a strong delusion. Mm -hmm. And it's like mm. the, the love of the truth is something that is offered. In order to, to not receive it, mm -hmm. it has to be available. And so it's, yeah. you know, I, I look at it as like the Almighty is giving every Everyone is offering them, do you want to love the truth? Because mm -hmm. you can never get enough of what you love. Yeah. And you receive that love of the yeah. truth, even in this gift, yeah. this uh, this gift. autistic well, look, gift. And, and it's been a right challenge. from the fourth fourth right, grade. I mean, right. you're you're compelled. You were driven. Yeah. I mean, wasn't it in high school? Everyone called you the 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 care right oh, I, in, I was, in I was, high school. I was just rejected. I was a care right in high school. I mean, imagine this is like going to uh, a Catholic school. Imagine Martin Luther is in Catholic high school and he's known as the Protestant and he's the only one <laughs> in the world as far as anybody knows at the time. I mean, there's others, but we didn't know that. There was no internet um, and there were certainly none to speak of in where I grew up in Chicago. But, but you know, this uh, autism sometimes can be a challenge, um, you know, especially interacting with people. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't say and I offend people. And also the other thing is I don't pick up on certain things, especially related to emotions. Um, and I tell people, if you're angry with me, you've got to say, I'm angry with you, because I will not pick up on cues. <laughs> I completely miss that stuff. But on the other hand, I'm like a pit bull with a bone when I get to the truth. Mm -hmm. I just won't drop mm -hmm. it. And, and, and this is what I realized looking back now at fourth grade, is everybody figured out what I figured. I, was, I didn't have any special insight that other people didn't have. Everybody saw what I saw. It was obvious. Mm -hmm. But they knew to keep their mouth shut, or maybe they said it once and they got their, rip, you know, their, their hand slapped and then they shut up. 
um, where I'm like, but this is true. I don't care if everybody else is telling me I'm wrong. We, you all must see this as true. It's obvious that, that, especially with, you know, when I was talking about the oral Torah, this is a bunch of rabbis arguing 2,000 years after Moses. This has nothing to do with the revelation of Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, so to me, I was just stating the obvious. And, and look, this has been a blessing and it's been cha has cha had challenges with it. But realizing that this is how my brain works has actually been really important for me because it made me yeah. realize, okay, other people think differently than I do. And, and I can now uh, bridge that gap and say, okay, I, I just don't understand why people are behaving the way they're behaving, why they see the truth and they don't respond to it and react to it, mm -hmm. why they, yeah. how they have this way of ignoring it. And I realize now, okay, people just, their brains are made differently than God made my brain. And I'm thankful the way he made me. Well, this answers a lot of the the, <laughs> the, the, the questions <laughs> and the problems that have come up because of your research, yeah. and we'll, we'll get into this. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to do more than one or two programs, okay. man, really. But uh, uh, because of your research in the ancient Hebrew Matthew, yeah. and and I understand that you yeah. found an additional 14 text from uh, what was originally uh, really brought forth by George Howard. I uh, think it's more, I think it's an additional 19 at this 19 point. 19 now, okay. Yeah. 28 altogether, and he had nine. Okay. So I'm bad at math, but I think that's 19. Uh, okay. And <laughs> so the, these were basically unknown. I mean, yeah. even even the museums that had them didn't even know what they had until. Uh, well, some of them. In other right. words, and, that, and I want to be really careful with that word discovered. Okay. Um, uh, in other words, I didn't find a, a scroll buried in the sand somewhere. What I did find, I'll give you an example, is you would have, you have around around 90 to 100,000 Hebrew manuscripts in the world that are, that are, are documented. Um, some of those, we don't know exactly what's in them. You'll go to the catalog at the National Library in Jerusalem, and it'll say something very vague. It'll say Jewish philosophical work, or which one? And it might be five different books in a single volume. What would happen is you'd have a, a wealthy Jew a thousand years ago who uh, had a little bit of free time on his hands, so he'd go to a scribe and he'd say, put together a book for me that has this, this, and that topic. And he'd put up a, they'd put together this collection of, could be five completely unrelated things, and, they, and the scribe would literally copy those books and hand it to the, to the benefactor, and he would read it and study it in his spare time. Well, we have a lot of those books today. Mm -hmm. And for example, there, there might be one, like I said, that says Jewish philosophical work. Within that philosophical work, it may contain a copy of this Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew. Well, you wouldn't find that out. The library that owns that book may not know what's in it, because they've got mm -hmm. another several thousand books you know, right, they just know right. it's some Jewish book for a bunch of Jewish books from the Middle Ages. So, th so when I say I've discovered those manuscripts, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Well, let's um, uh, l let's yeah. let's go to an incident right here because yeah. we're going to have to do another program on that Hebrew Matthew. Yeah. But there is an incident uh, yeah. because of, of a question that they came up. We yeah. discussed it. You started doing some work on it. You went to the manuscript library. Mm -hmm. You checked out this manuscript, and when you returned it, a very yeah. interesting question came up. Yeah, so that was the a, a manuscript of the Gospel of Matthew from St. Petersburg, Russia. Now St. Petersburg is today, I think it's, I think it's called St. Petersburg again. I don't know, uh, they keep changing I, the I, name. I, I, it was called Leningrad, Leningrad and Petrograd and had a, had a bunch of different names over, over the years. Um, it has a, one of the most important collection, the largest collection of Hebrew manuscripts in the world, which were, scholars didn't have access to for 70 years during the time of the Soviet Union. Well, mm -hmm. as soon as the Soviet Union fell, Israeli scholars rushed over to Russia. Uh, they, they went over there very quickly with, with cameras and got permission to photograph the manuscripts. And you ask, why did it they- was like, what, what 30,000 of them, some? Tens of thousands, I don't know the exact number. It's tens of thousands in two separate collections. And, and these were gathered in the 1800s by the, by the Russian czars. Um, and they went over very quickly because they said, right now there's freedom to allow us to copy these manuscripts we don't know what's going to happen a month from now or two months from now. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union might come back or something worse than it might come back, and these might all be burned. So they photographed all the manuscripts, and now there's a copy of them in Jerusalem. Well, there's tens of thousands of manuscripts. What's in them? They're still being cataloged. Last I checked, they were still being cataloged right. almost 20 years later, 15 years later. And when I checked out the one uh, on Hebrew Matthew, oh, about... It was maybe over 10 years ago now. It was over 10 years oh, ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow, that, a long, long time has passed. Mm -hmm. So, oh, wow. It's probably so wait, 15 years ago wait now. Wait a second. So that was 25 years ago. That, that, is that right? 1991 was 25 years ago. Oh, wow. So 
That can't be true. <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't that far. It wasn't that no, but I'm talking about when they photographed this oh, manuscript. Oh, yeah, right, right. That, so 25 right. years ago, they photographed that's, that's the manuscript. Correct. I come 10 years after that to look at it. And they said, was there anything interesting in that manuscript? And and, and it wasn't it wasn't labeled. It wasn't, well, it's, you said... You have to understand, this is a microfilm that has 20, 30 different books on it. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily know what's in it. Right, and, right. And, that, Hebrew, and that's the point. They and, don't know what's in this And Hebrew thing. Matthew itself is part of, uh, it was copied by a Jewish rabbi named Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut in 1380. And he included it as the 12th section of a book called Evan Bochan, the test stone. So maybe in their, in their, um, in their catalog it says that this is, has Evan Bochan. That doesn't mean it has Hebrew Matthew. Mm -hmm. Not every mm -hmm. copy of Evan Bochan is complete. Um, and then there's copies of Hebrew Matthew that aren't part of Evan Bochan. So, um, in any event, he says, is there anything interesting in there? And I said, that's a really strange question. Why'd you ask that? And, and that's a librarian. This you're is turning the librarian. It back in. He said, nobody has ever checked out this microfilm before. <laughs> so words, you're literally the first person to look at the, that photograph of the Hebrew Matthew. Since it had been photographed 10 years earlier, I'm the first person to check it out and look at it, which is like blowing my mind. This is... You know, I think one of the most important documents in, in existence, a Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew preserved by the Jews, mm -hmm. um, which yeah. as far as we can see is not a translation from Greek, and nobody had looked at it. And, and, the, and the reason is that it, uh, it falls between the cracks, meaning the Hebrew scholars who are experts in the Hebrew language don't really care that much about the Gospel of Matthew, um, and the Christian scholars don't really have access to Hebrew manuscripts, um, you know, and, and they focus on the Greek. That tends to be where they come from. So I was the first person to look at it, and maybe other people have looked at it since, but you know, this is quite a number of years ago. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was really exciting. And, and you know, yeah, and uh, like I said, there's 28 of those manuscripts. I didn't discover it, it was uh, the Hebrew Matthew was published in 1987 by George Howard, and he used That's nine right. manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And you have yeah, his we book have, here. Uh, have his book here. And yeah, this is actually right. the 1995 re-edit of his uh, book. The original one from 1987 is a much better book. It's called The Gospel of Matthew According to a Primitive Hebrew Text. Um, right. He, he right. actually published along with the Hebrew text these studies, and here he has different studies, which are interesting, but to me not as interesting as the original ones. And, um, and what I did is I, and he actually says, he says there must be more than nine manuscripts, but he wasn't that interested in, in looking for them. He, he didn't have access to like, for example, if he wanted to look at a manuscript, he had to write a letter to the British Museum and say, I've heard you have this manuscript. Can you t send me a photograph of it? What I did is I went to the National Library in Israel, which has a about 90,000 photograph manuscripts, and looked at the microfilms. A and then sometimes I would, you know, pull out a microfilm and it would say, you know, Jewish polemical work, and I'd look, and it didn't have Hebrew Matthew, but sometimes it did. And it was stuff that Howard didn't know about, and as far as I can tell, nobody else knew about some of these. So. Mm -hmm. Well, this, uh, uh, you know, th this goes back, uh, I, I was actually accessing this yeah. uh, before you and I got together mm -hmm. in finding some solutions to some problems in Matthew. Mm -hmm. uh, because even in some of the Greek text in the margin mm -hmm. of Matthew, mm -hmm. they would write in Greek meaning uncertain. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. we know what these words are in Greek, but mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense still. Mm -hmm. and, and there were apparent contradictions in the English versions of Matthew, mm -hmm. and so this solved part of it. Mm -hmm. However, it was a question that came up, and we're going to address this. We're going to have mm -hmm. to spend some more time on this, yeah. because a question came up that even George Howard, even though he had the correct manuscript, he still translated it wrong, and you were the one that, that was able to, because of your command of Hebrew yeah. and in your position at Hebrew University, yeah. you were able to decipher something that is absolutely critical for <laughs> anyone to understand what Yeshua is teaching. I, I know we're running out of time for this segment, Michael, but I, I just got, I'm laughing because I open up here. I, I won't give him the answer, but literally on the left side of the page it says one thing in Hebrew, and on the right side in English, it says a completely different thing. And what it says in English is a translation from the Greek. <laughs> yeah. So why bother putting the Hebrew there? Um, and exactly. I and I actually understand why he did it. And maybe we could talk about it in, in a different segment because it, it, it's, we, we, it's we will pretty, because it's cool. this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have to tell you that um, it was after. Uh, Nehemiah began working on these things, and uh, we were in Jerusalem together. He would come over to the apartment. Uh, I would discuss things with him, some problems that I was having. Uh, he would uh, do some research on it, and it was after that period of time that I remember this day very distinctly. I was standing in my living room with a, with a group of people, 
and I was hearkening back to when I was 17 years old. I was reading the Sermon on the Mount. I was doing this uh, out in a wheat field out by my house in Michigan, and I was putting it in my own words. And I got to this phrase, the gospel of the kingdom, and I realized that I grew up in church my whole life. You know, going to, to church, I was uh, there for, for six different services a week and, uh, you know, seven if you count uh, softball, church softball, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, my life was in church. And, and yet I knew right then I have no idea what this means, the gospel of the kingdom. But it is because of what Nehemiah Gordon has done in his work in the Hebrew Matthew, I remember distinctly, I was 50 years old at, at the time, and I hearkened back to that and I said to this group of people, I said, I now know that I'm beginning to understand the gospel of the kingdom. It's taken my entire life, I've been searching for it, I've been studying for it, I've been trying to live it, but for the first time in my life, I now know I'm beginning to understand it. And so what we're going to do is dig deeper into this uh, in these uh, ne next episodes uh, with the Cary Scholar, Nehemia Gordon. But right now, we're gonna take a break, as we do each week, to give you an opportunity to stand with this ministry. It was back before the turn of the century, 1998, 1999, I forget why, which one right off the top of my head, but I was invited to the Israeli New Moon Society annual convention in which uh, the main speaker, uh, uh, this is the first time that I was going to meet him, but uh, this is a group of the ultra-Orthodox Jews who were dedicated to restoring the ancient biblical calendar, knowing that in 359 of the Common Era, the last act of the Sanhedrin was to institute a new reckoning of time based on mathematics rather than the visible site of the new moon and the Aviv uh, barley in the land of Israel, which they knew that was the original way of doing it until they changed it. And now they were setting uh, a, a time to get together and to go over these parameters in preparation for the Messiah coming and restoring the calendar that was in use until 359. It was at that meeting that uh, the, the president of the Israeli New Moon Society, who will remain mentionless at this point for uh, an obvious reason in just a moment, 
that uh, he was aware of the calendar that I had published. Uh, it was uh, written about in a couple of, of journals there in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, he had the calendar and he came back to meet me and he said, there's one more thing that you've got to get right in order for this to, to be the, uh, the original calendar. And he then tore off a piece of paper from my tablet he wrote down a name and a telephone number and he put it underneath his thumb. And he said, you need to give this man a call as soon as possible. And he said, now, don't show this to anyone because it'll get us both thrown out of here. Do you understand? Well, I had no idea what he was saying, but I understood that no one was to see this number. I had no idea why, but he took his thumb off it. I put my thumb over it. I rolled it up into a little ball, stuck it in my pocket. And the next morning, a call was made, and within a few hours, we were sitting at coffee time, a coffee shop uh, just off Ben Yehuda, and that is when I met Nehemi Gordon for the first time and found out why it would have got us both thrown out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, Nehemi Gordon, here he yeah, is. Yeah. Here he is now, uh, uh, what is it, like 18, 18 years later, something oh, wow. like that. Uh, and, Quite a number uh, of years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a long time mm -hmm. ago. We were just kids back then. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, as I sat there and listened to you, then mm -hmm. I realized you were very... Um, you were explaining what a care right was, mm -hmm. and and you were really uh, you know had an edge about you you know and that that edge was really um, I believe you called them rabbinites. Uh huh. Uh, right. and, well, in, uh, in Jewish literature, um, there's actually a distinction between karaim and rabbanim, karaites and rabbinites, mm -hmm. and even rabbinical Jews refer to themselves as rabbinites in in you know writings from you know 500 years ago, a thousand years ago. So that's not a, that's not a, what the Karaites call the rabbinical Jews, it's even what they called themselves. A thousand years ago, the Jewish world was split around 50-50, uh, half Karaite, half Rabbinite. Um, today, there's relatively few Karaites, around 45,000, they say, in the world. Um, and, you know, and most Jews today are Rabbinites, rabbinical Jews. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I've been to a couple of Karaite synagogues. Yeah. The oldest synagogue in the Old City yeah. is actually uh, The oldest a, a synagogue Karaite. of, oldest uh, continuing fu continually functioning synagogue of any kind in, uh, in Jerusalem is a Karaite synagogue. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And then uh, went out to the Karaite community, out to the synagogue out there with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, about 30,000 uh, in Israel, I understand. Well, the number has, you know, grown. I think that's a number you, you heard maybe 20 years ago. But <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's right. That's what it was So, yeah, they're saying ago. it's around 45,000 now. So oh, okay. a little bit of yeah. increase, yeah. So, you were, um, obviously, um, the, the Orthodox scholars mm -hmm. knew that mm -hmm. you had a key Mm -hmm. concerning the calendar that I had to be aware of, that, that uh, I had the astronomically corrected biblical Hebrew calendar mm -hmm. based on uh, mathematical calculations for the sighting of the new moon, mm -hmm. and, and that's basically a, a trainer uh, mm -hmm. because it's really what you see, it's not what you can calculate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, so, and yeah. you, you had been part of the sighting of the new moon and mm -hmm. also, uh, very importantly, the, uh, the mm -hmm. other part that the uh, rabbinic scholars mm -hmm. were not, um, you know, this wasn't their bailiwick, but it was the Aviv. Right, and, and, and the really interesting thing is, you know, in, in the Hebrew Roots movement, there are all these different calendars. There's, I can't even count how many calendars there are. Uh, Karite Jews follow this biblical astronomical new moon calendar. Um, rabbinical Jews follow the Hillel II calendar. But they don't actually disagree on the principle. Um, I actually right. recently interviewed um, a couple of Orthodox Jews. Um, th I have this podcast series, Hebrew Voices, and I've interviewed three different Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jews, and they all agree the biblical calendar before the time of Hill II, 359 AD, was based on the sighting of the new moon. There's no dispute about that. What mm -hmm. they do dispute is do we have the authority to follow that today when we don't have a Sanhedrin? That becomes the question. And what they say is that when the Sanhedrin is reestablished, and the Messiah is king over Israel on earth, then there will be a, um, a return to the sighting of the new moon. Mm -hmm. Here's where my Asperger's comes in, because I say, why not just do it now? Why are we waiting for the Messiah to come and the, the uh, Sanhedrin to be reestablished? We know what to do, let's do it now. Let's just go outside and sight the new moon. What's the problem? Right, and because there are hundreds 
of people that are doing it every month. There's a rabbinic court that meets that hears their testimony. They log it in. They've been logging it in for more than a decade Look, now. Look, all it would take was would be for a leading rabbi to you know to call upon the. Orthodox Jews to cite the new moon, and you would have tens of thousands of people looking for the new moon that, that's all right. over Israel. That's all it would take. Mm -hmm. But what they're saying now is, well, we can't do it. We don't have the authority. And here's what it really comes down to. If I step out of line and start following the sighting of the new moon, I won't fit into my synagogue. That's what they're, you know, very reasonably is what they're thinking is. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. as someone with Asperger's, I don't care about that. I just want to follow the truth. And, and, and I always struggled with this. I, I, you know, and I can speak about people in synagogues. That pe you know, Jews would go to synagogue week after week and hear the rabbi say things and be told, this is how you have to do things. And they would know that's not what God commanded. They would know that's not true, but they don't say anything about it. And even if they kind of whisper about it, they don't do anything about it. And, and I never understood that until I understood all this whole Asperger's thing, that people go to synagogue for the social experience. And, and, you know, and then the, the community, the community, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And as somebody with, you know, with autism, that doesn't really do much for me. Um, it actually makes me stressed out <laughs> the communal experience, to be honest with you. Um, and um, so actually realizing this about four years ago that I had this autism made me realize, okay, so now I can understand why they're doing that. It actually gave me a lot of empathy for people who they go to synagogue week after week and they know the rabbi is speaking nonsense. The rabbi probably knows he's speaking nonsense in some cases. But this is what you have to say if, if you don't want to be kicked out of your own community. Um, and, and my attitude was, I just want the truth. I, I don't care if I'm the only one. I just want the truth. I just mm -hmm. want to follow the truth, you know, and the best of my ability. And, and this is the amazing thing. I interview these three different guys, these three different ultra-Orthodox uh, rabbinical Jews, and they're all agreeing, yeah, it's, it's the new moon it's, and it's the Aviv, and it's not even a question. Um, the right, question because is, the, the records go back uh, oh, to the first century. It's as clear as, as could possibly be. And it, we have here the Talmud. The Talmud, the earliest parts of the Talmud go back to probably around 150 B.C., and you can actually tell that when you read it in the original language. Parts are in Hebrew, parts are in Aramaic, parts are in uh, uh, Judean and Galilean Aramaic. So you can tell when things are from. Mm -hmm. And there is, um, you know, very clear evidence that in the first century A.D., at the time the temple stood, the biblical calendar was based on the sighting of the new moon and the, and the Aviv in the land of Israel. There's really no question about that. There might have been other things that were thrown in there. Um, you know, the Sanhedrin and all kinds of things like that. But basically that was the system up until when the Romans abolished the Sanhedrin. And it's the rabbis saying this, and this very same rabbis saying that when the Sanhedrin is reestablished, then they'll go back to the sighting of the new moon. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why, you know, I, I deal with these people who, who uh, in the Hebrew roots movement, who will contact me and say, you know, you're wrong, it's not the Aviv and the new moon, it's the star calendar, the stork calendar, all kinds of things, and I'm like, Hey, I have no problem. Do whatever you want. I, you know, that, that has nothing to do with me. I'm just focusing on the truth here. And, mm -hmm. um, but it's strange to me that, that like they're coming up with all these theories and they don't have any basis in the ancient sources. Yeah. Well, see, and this is where it all started for me and why this became so mm -hmm. important is because uh, now it's been more than 40 years ago that I started mm -hmm. working on the chronology of the gospels. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, Part of this, of, of course, is that, you know, the, the, the Gospels were written by Jews for Jews to Jews, and you've got Gentiles trying to interpret scriptures that Jews wrote. You know, uh, I, I'll say at the end of this entire series we do, we'll leave plenty of time for the Gentiles to interpret all the scriptures <laughs> they wrote, which uh, we'll leave an entire segment that uh, uh, three seconds of those won't need to air. But see, this, uh, uh, b because of the biblical calendar, we can yeah. go back and we mm. can figure these things out. And because uh, of the work that, that we did, and this goes back to more than well over 30 years uh, concerning the biblical calendar, um, the Julian calendar was put in place 42 years before Yeshua was born. Uh, we can roll the uh, celestial time clock back and find the first sliver of the new moon. We know when Passover, mm -hmm. we know when all the feasts are, and so that is what it took to, to be able to, to put this all together. Mm -hmm. That's why I started on it. And, you know, it was 30, you know, it was, my goodness, it was more than 35 years ago that mm -hmm. we knew that in Yeshua's ministry that year there had to be an Adar bet, but it was just unprovable. Mm -hmm. It was unprovable until mm -hmm. then, 
I got together with you and then found out that you were establishing, you know, finding the parameters, not establishing, but finding the parameters in the spring when the barley is a vive, when it's not a vive, and, you know, before a certain period of time, it's never going to be a vive. After a certain period of time, mm -hmm. it'll basically always be a vive. But there's right. this pocket in there that even, even this yeah. year, both of us thought that, uh, we were both in America, you know, before the Aviv, and yeah. the earliest time it was possible, and yeah. we kind of expected that we were going to see Aviv in March this year. Mm -hmm. And but again, oh, I was I was sure there was no question. I wouldn't say no question. I was 95% sure that we were going to find Aviv in March. Um, even once I got to Israel and started looking in the fields, I'm like, okay, this is really close. That we still got some time, <laughs> and it wasn't. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it, it wasn't. Now, and this is something I learned years yeah. ago, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, that, that uh, I disagree with Nehemia uh, concerning the Aviv in, on a particular year. Mm. I don't know if you remember that. I was don't. back in 2000, <laughs> 2001. And, okay. uh, uh, and after the fact, then I realized, mm. Mm. no, this is your bailiwick. This is your field. Mm. You were right. No pun intended, field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the barley is his yeah, field. Yeah. Uh, that he was right on this. And mm. see, I was establishing the parameter that had to be a Aviv on the side of the Mount of Olives mm. because of okay. the rehearsals, what was done by the priest. Mm. Uh, but yet, um, you know, you saw in the ancient literature, all, no, it, it's, uh, you know, Land you've got to be Israel. reasonable, yeah. si uh, you know, proximity mm -hmm. uh, uh, to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You found it down mm -hmm. in the Dead Sea Valley, and it turns out that mm -hmm. if it's down there, like uh, at Mizpah uh, Yericho, uh, and that's where mm -hmm. you found it that year, okay. right, right down there, and that, you know, two weeks later, it's Aviv on the side of the Mount of Olives, mm -hmm. and what is the, uh, uh, the parameter in the scripture is parched Aviv. Aviv kaluy ba'esh is a phrase in Leviticus 2.14. And, and here's how I came to this whole topic. I knew the rabbinical calendar was made up in 359 A.D. And I'm reading, trying to figure out, so what was before 359 A.D.? So I started out, we've got the four postponements, the hill of the second added in. Okay, strip those off. Well, wait a minute, but that's still not what the Tanakh is saying. That's still not what's in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And I trace it back and I find out the new moon. That was pretty easy. And I'm trying to figure out all this whole Aviv thing. And I, and I shared this with you last night that um, I, I had figured out, okay, it's based on the crops in Israel. It didn't make any sense to me. I grew up in the Midwest in America. And in the U.S., you have two grain crops a year. You've got like winter wheat and fall wheat. So, I mean, it's not like the barley gets mm -hmm. ripe the same time every year. How could you have a calendar based on that? It doesn't make any sense. And, and there I was. I was actually sitting in a synagogue um, in, in Chicago, and everybody else was doing the rabbinical liturgy, reciting these prayers by rote, and I was actually praying from my heart, saying, God, I, I want to understand this. How is this even possible? And the answer just came to me as I was sitting there praying. And you have to understand, in my tradition I came from, you don't pray to God for answers. You pray to God as a service. You're, 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 it's actually called avodah, work. You're praying to God as a service in place of the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. But there I All was... Right praying to God saying, I want the answer. I want to understand this. And, and, and the answer just came to me. And then I arrived in Israel and I found out there had been people already who had started to work on this pro project back in 1988 before I even arrived in Israel, going out and looking for the Aviv. When I arrived in 92, I said, take me out into the fields and show me. So they had been and doing it for four years before you yeah, arrived. That's okay. Absolutely, absolutely and you're just right. out of high school at I'm, this point. Well, a couple years out of high school. I okay. graduated in 90, 92. I, I was in Israel. Um, I finally moved to Israel permanently in 93, but I was there in 92. And I said, you know, show me the fields. And we'd go out in the fields and they'd show me stuff and I was learning how to do it. And, and the, the son of the man who, who took me out into those fields back in 1992, he's still involved today. Um, with the Aviv, but but in some ways it was very innocent, and and it was completely innocent. But in some ways it was very peaceful, because it was just me and a few other people who cared in the Karite Jewish community, and nobody else in the world knew or cared what we were doing. Most of the Karites didn't care. Most of the Karites they had had this idea. They had done this for for over a thousand years. But there's this great uh, uh, work in 1860. There's this Karite writing uh, uh, about the Aviv in Cairo. And he says, well, we used to do this, but we haven't done it for a long time. Uh, he doesn't say how long, interestingly, but we haven't done it for a long time. And he said, when we get back to the land of Israel, we'll go back to doing it. 
So there I and am. And that, that is speaking of uh, finding the finding Aviv. Finding the Aviv in the land of Israel. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's go back because uh, when, when the mm. uh, the Sanhedrin changed the calendar to a calculated yeah. calendar, there were a lot of people that did not go along with this in 359, right? They say, right. you know, you, they, they said specifically, we're making talk a note. Mm. We're making a law oh, which absolutely. changes biblical law. Yeah. And at that time, the, the Karaites said, no, you, you, know, you don't add, you don't subtract from. I mean, that mm -hmm. is the foundational commandment in all of the Torah. Right. You add to or subtract from, you no longer have the commandments. Well, so here, and, he, and so here's, now, here's where it got, you know, here's why they did this in 359 AD. You know, the, the way it's usually described is the Sanhedrin was abolished, they were going to exile, and they needed some way of guessing when the new moon and Aviv would be in the land of Israel when they were out in exile in, you know, in, in Rome and, and Iraq and you know, all over the world in Persia. Mm -hmm. And that's true. But it's actually more than that because there were still Jews who remained, for example, in Galilee. There were Jews who never left Galilee. There's a synagogue up in, in the Galilee, a place called Pikiin, where there have always been Jews. It was on a mountaintop. Even the Crusaders never drove the Jews out of there. Really? So there have always been Jews in the land of Israel, a small number. But the problem wasn't, for those who weren't in Israel, look, you had no choice. If you were a Jew in Russia, even a Karite Jew in the Middle Ages, you had no choice but to follow some kind of guess. And they actually talk about this, the Karites in the Middle Ages. They say, well, out here in Constantinople, we guess because we don't know what's going on in Israel. And they say, but when a traveler comes, then we correct, even if it's in the middle of the year, we'll correct it. That, that, and, that's, um, that's right, I remember. And, yeah, it's pretty cool. And we have actually examples. We have the other side of it. This rabbi is writing in like the 1100s and he writes this letter to his brother and he says, he says these Karaites are doing this thing just to upset us, that they've, uh, in the middle of the year, they changed the calendar because some merchant showed up and told them that there was something about Aviv in, in Israel. And so from his perspective, this is, they're just trying to, you know, rock the boat. And the Karaites are like, we just want the truth. We don't care, you know, <laughs> So we're just trying to do, follow the truth. So, and they would change, correct it in so the middle. The whole of the, group of Aspergers. Uh, I'm telling you, it's an Aspergers <laughs> movement. I'm convinced of that. Um, <laughs> I'm sticking with that. But actually, some of the rabbinical Jews had uh, some very severe Aspergers, which maybe is a different discussion. Um, <laughs> I'm convinced that Maimonides had very severe Aspergers, probably as bad as my father, if blessed memory had it. Anyway, but that's a different topic. So here's what it came down to for the rabbis. It wasn't just that the new moon was sighted. It was that the pro Sanhedrin proclaimed that the new moon was sighted. And there's this great passage in the Mishnah. It says, if the Sanhedrin and all of Israel saw the moon, but the Sanhedrin itself didn't proclaim it to be so, then it doesn't count. You, keep the, the, you begin the month the next day. So imagine you're in 359 AD, and, and you're a Jew in, in Pikiin up on the mountaintop, and the Sanhedrin's been abolished. It doesn't matter that you saw the moon in the land of Israel, because the Sanhedrin didn't proclaim it to be so. So there were Jews throughout history who said, no way, if we see it, that's all we need. And they were, so they continued to do this. We have this great account from 1642. There was a Karite who comes from Crimea to go on a pilgrimage to the land of Israel, and it takes them several months. There were pirates. I guess things haven't changed that much. That right, And the right. Eastern mm -hmm. Mediterranean was covered with Muslim pirates, mm -hmm. and so it took him a very long time to get to Israel. He says how when he left Constantinople, it was on Sukkot. And then he says he arrived in um, Cairo a month later, and he says we celebrated Sukkot a second time based on the finding of the Aviv in the land of Israel. So in Cairo in 1642, they were still doing Aviv based, they would send people to Israel, and they would keep the Aviv based on that. And, but now jump ahead to 1860, and this other Karite is saying, well, we haven't done it for a long time. How long? I don't know, sometime after 1642, mm -hmm. right? Um, and he says, but when we get back to Israel, we'll go back, we'll be able to go in the fields and look at the Aviv barley. So I come along in 1992 and these other guys before me in 88 and say, so why aren't we doing this? We're back now. And the answer was, even for these Karaites, well, we've just become accustomed through tradition to doing it this way. And, and you know, mm -hmm. to me it was like, well, wait a minute, you're Karaites, you're not supposed to be bound by tradition. That's the whole point. And I can say that till I'm blue in the face. The other Karaites are like, well, no, we... You know, we're still going to do tradition. And, and, and so this is where, you know, I'm, where for me it was in some ways very peaceful because it was literally me and, you know, two or three other people going out in the fields looking at the barley and just, mm -hmm. that's what it is. We're going to do it. Right. And, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a few dozen people would, you know, be waiting for this answer and, and you know, the, around, the families around us and care about that. Um, it, it, there was a certain, like, you know, as I say, innocence and peacefulness to do to it. Um, and I only say that because in recent years, um, 
I'm still doing the same thing I did back then, <laughs> going out in the fields and just seeing what it is. But other people are coming with their agendas and their other concepts, yeah, and, and there, they want to drag me into that. And I'm like, look, I'm mm -hmm. just in the car looking at the barley. I don't know right. how to do anything else. I don't want to do anything else. And, and that's a, I'm just going to follow was, it where it leads. Yeah, and that was, I say that your work on that is what allowed me to do the chronological gospels and mm -hmm. do this accurately. Yeah. And that's where it all started for me. And you know, I was, I was yeah. on the calendar issue more than 35 years ago, mm -hmm. but without the work that you did, okay, we knew there was an eight or bet, but it was unprovable until the work that you did. You know, it wasn't just the people that were there mm -hmm. four years before. You kept mm -hmm. on documenting oh, yeah. it year after year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, then, you know, when I, um, you know, started putting out things out uh, concerning the calendar, concerning the chronological gospels. People more and more yeah. became aware of what you were doing, and then mm -hmm. we saw people coming out of the woodwork creating new calendars. Most just Gentiles making up new calendars based on you know whether the storks are flying, all or whether they're at the garbage dump all year all, all in, in Israel. Things, Michael, you know, I, I want to say something. I, I know we're running out of time. I want to say something. You know, so, so one of the things I learned about people with Asperger's is, the, is they focus on details. They're very detail oriented. And I do believe that God gave me this Asperger's so I could focus on details that other people wouldn't even bother with, like vowels and, and, and the, you know, the stages of barley and things like that. Other people mm -hmm. wouldn't even right. care. They, they would, they want, they're big picture people. And, and I have to admit that sometimes in my focus on the details, I'll miss the big picture. I admit that. And, and where I want to say, Michael, I want to, I want to give you credit that one of the places where you have a genius, an absolute genius, I think, is that you can take those details and find a big picture that you could point it to me afterwards and I still might not see it. But you, you, you know, we met about 20 years ago, 18 years ago, and you were able to see things that other people heard about, but they didn't get the big picture. And you got the big picture. And I want to give you credit for that. I think that's actually really an important thing. Um, you know, they say people miss the forest for the trees. I'm not looking at the trees. I'm looking at the cells and the leaves mm -hmm. and I miss the forest. And I admit that. And I'm now aware of that because I'm aware of my condition. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can then understand, oh, that's how they're seeing this big picture. But you really have a genius, Michael, the, of seeing the big picture and seeing the value. Cause I'd met, met other Hebrew roots and Messianic people. And they're like, well, you don't believe in Yeshua. We're done. The conversation's over. And you were able to see a big picture that other people didn't see. So I mm -hmm. want to thank you for that. Can I thank you for that, Michael? It well, well, means a lot well, to well, me. Well, thank you. And thank you, uh, uh because really, it, it's you looking at those individual cells and then, you know, years and years, the, the research continues and it keeps on filling in the picture. Mm -hmm. And that is what I love about what you do, your honesty, the things that you provided for me. And we're going to have to hit some of these things uh, in, in some future uh, sessions. Stay, yeah. stay with me. You okay. know, hey, hang in here for a little while. Uh, as long you know, as spend, the coffee keeps coming. Okay, well, we'll do some, <laughs> we'll do some more coffee. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, this is, you're in for, for one of the greatest treats in life. And for, uh, you know, some people might think, uh, you, know, you know, this is slow or whatever. For, for, for the two of us, this is like, man, we're, we're, this is just a slice of heaven uh, to be able to get into some of the, uh, some of the minutia. And uh, it was years ago, remember when we did the, the first half hour, the creator's wow. uh, uh, time clock. Uh, that we did this. We're both young. We're sitting on we the southern. I think we both had a lot more hair. <laughs> we did. We both had a lot more hair, and uh, and this was the lost episode for a lo the longest time. And then the four and a half hour video we did together, uh, and that is the Creator's calendar. So if you want to understand the Creator's reckoning of time, this is the place to go. We have both of these that are available, and uh, we have Nehemiah that's going to be back with us again next time for Shabbat Night Live. One of the things that's been really important in my journey is the Bilkat Kohanim, the priestly blessing. That's the blessing in Numbers chapter 6, where God gives this blessing to the children of Aaron. And at the end, he says, and they shall place my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And this is the blessing that, that there have been Kohanim who have been proclaiming this every day for 3,500 years. Yevarechecha Yehovah v'yishmarecha. Ya'er Yehovah panav elecha v'yichunecha. Yisa Yehova Panav Elecha, V'yasem Lecha Shalom, Amen. Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, Shavuot Tov, we will see you next week here on Shabbat Night Live. Shalom, y'all.
Wait, where do you think you're going? You're not done yet. You gotta subscribe if you wanna see more of this stuff. Just click the button up here. Better yet, you can click here to watch more right now. And if you like what you see, support what we do. Donate here to keep the broadcast coming. Thank you.